Welcome to our third lecture on Chapter 24, which is the chapter in our textbook that covers employment and discrimination law. Um, we are on the third lecture. In the first two lectures, we discussed at-will employment. We discussed employment discrimination law. Uh, specifically, we talked about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We discussed the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. We talked about um, the different theories for discrimination law, disparate treatment and disparate impact. And we talked about sexual harassment and also other types of protected category harassment. We discussed the, the existence of BFOQs and bona fide uh, seniority systems. And we discussed the EEOC charge process. Now we are ready to start talking about individual employees' rights and those that particular area of the law. You may recall in the first two lectures, I uh, talked about how this was probably about 85% of the realistic exposure that employers have. And this is probably about 10%-ish. And this is probably 5% at most for our particular uh, part of the, of the United States. So this is where the real activity is. So lectures one and two is the most important part uh, for this topic. But when we get into these other areas, it's not as if these other areas are less dense in terms of law. In fact, I would argue that these two areas probably actually have, each one of them have more stuff to know than exists in this category. It's just that it's much less likely that you will have a major issue in your career, either as a potential plaintiff or as um, a member of the management team in your organization. So I'm going to do even a briefer dive into these topics. I did a, an embarrassingly brief dive into these topics, just enough to kind of introduce some ideas so that when an issue comes up, you kind of can spot it and say, well, okay, wait a second, that's employment discrimination. I know enough to know I need to get a professional involved here. Here, we're even going to do a little bit briefer of a review simply because, you know, as I think I said in previous lectures, whole courses are offered in these topics. And... Um, it just doesn't make sense to invest that level of resources uh, for a, a business person, especially a business person who isn't necessarily focused on a career in HR. So we're going to cover in this lecture other employment laws that focus on individual employees' rights. The first statute we're going to look at is the FLSA. That's the common term for the Fair Labor Standards Act. One helpful hint as you're looking at these laws is to notice when they use the word employment or discrimination in contrast to labor. Usually when you see the word labor, you should think union. Um, but this is an exception to that rule. Um, in this particular statute, it has nothing to do with unionization, and yet it still has the word labor in it. You may think, well, why is that? Why, why does this statute not follow the rules? And it's an historic artifact. Um, this law was one of the very first laws that the Congress passed to protect employees. Um, in the time that this law was passed, I believe it was in the 40s, it might have been the late 30s, um, there was a really fundamentally different understanding about the relationship between employee and employer. Um, a large portion of the um, workforce was blue collar meaning that they were people who uh, performed tasks using their hands um, and uh, did work that, you know, they could get dirty in is, is kind of the idea here. Um, it wasn't that it was work that was, uh, sometimes it was less intellectually demanding and more physically demanding, but in many cases it was intellectually demanding, but it was more get dirt under your fingernails type of work. And so work of that nature, at least back then, was thought of more as labor than employment. Now, honestly, we all labor, even if you work as a CEO in a, a Fortune 500 company, you are laboring. And the, the uh, employee who is um, digging ditches and uh, laying asphalt, he is employed. So these terms are synonymous with each other, but but we tend to use the term labor when the work is physically demanding, and we're more likely to use the term employment when we're talking about um, employment that is 
less physical in its nature. So that just reflects a, a demographic or a, an, an economic shift in our culture. So the Fair Labor Standards Act, first of all, is a federal law, and everything we've, we've covered at this point has been a federal law. Uh, we will in a couple of minutes get to some state laws, but at this point, we've been talking exclusively federal, and again, that means national law. We're not talking about Texas state-specific laws. One of the things that the FLSA does is it establishes a minimum wage. This is the least amount of hourly wages that a worker in the United States can earn under most circumstances. There are exceptions to the FLSA, so there are circumstances in which a person can earn less. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, some uh, employment within a family. So if you work for your parents in a business, the parents don't have to pay you $7.25 an hour. Also, if you are working in an industry that is traditionally tip uh, related, for example, being a waiter or waitress. Um, in those particular professions, you don't earn $7.25 an hour. In addition, if you work on a commission basis, there is some flexibility about how your hourly rate actually works out. And then there are other exceptions relating to agriculture and a few other um, niches. But for the most part, the majority of workers in our economy are going to earn at least $7.25 an hour in order to, um, for that to be a lawful wage situation. How is this uh, amount determined? Well, actually, Congress passes a law about it. There is no cost of living adjustment. So this amount uh, typically doesn't go up until Congress decides to act. As a result, um, the, the wages kind of tend to follow this path. You know, we'll go a long time with one wage, then it will go up significantly. We, well, I'm sorry, we, we, it has never gone down. It will be a long time with this wage rate, then it'll jump up significantly. And if we had a built-in, say, inflation rated adjustment, you would see a curve more like, you know, this. I mean, there might be a little bit of a jump every year. They might do kind of like little mini stairs, but it would be a much smoother curve. Um, the minimum wage is a very political issue in the United States. Uh, people have differing perspectives on what the appropriate minimum wage ought to be. And there's lots of arguments in favor of raising the minimum wage and against raising a minimum wage. Uh, people who are in favor of raising the minimum wage um, are uh, not necessarily, um, well, I, I mean, many times they have good intentions, but many times um, the, the repercussions of raising a minimum wage can actually be negative for the working poor. Um, because think about it this way. Um, I am uh, a person of limited skills, and um, I can get a job when the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Maybe I'm working at McDonald's. Maybe I'm uh, working at some other place. Uh, doing uh, some, some jobs that don't involve, don't require a lot of skills. Then the minimum wage goes up, we'll say, to $15 an hour. Well, places like McDonald's um, will probably decide, well, gee whiz, we can do, you know, because that's going to significantly impact our expense structure because labor is a major factor. And so we're going to have to make some adjustments. For example, we might automate more of the processes that happen inside the restaurant. Or we might be willing to accept a lower level of customer satisfaction, longer lines, maybe a less carefully made meals. In other words, we're going to reduce the number of man hours that we need for our particular restaurants. And that means we'll employ fewer people. Well, as a result, if let's say that particular McDonald's used to employ, we'll say 30 people, and now they've decided to employ 20 people, maybe I'm one of those individuals who doesn't make the cut. There's a 20 uh, of the 30 people in the group. There's at least 20 who are more qualified than I am. And so I might find that instead of uh, seeing my, my wage go from $7.25 an hour to $15 an hour, I am now going from $7.25 an hour to $0.00 and zero cents an hour. Of course, if I am one of the more skilled workers, 
if I'm in that top 20 group, then I am a major, uh, I, made, I significantly benefited by the raise in the hourly rate. So a raise in the hourly rate typically helps the wealthier of the poor, and that's kind of a funny expression, and it harms the poorer of the poor. And so um, it, it becomes kind of a political decision about how that uh, should play out. Um, and then there's issues about, well, should we have uh, differing minimum wages for differing at parts of the economy? Lots of different and complex issues. Reasonable people can definitely disagree on what that number ought to be. But in any event, the number is what it is today, $7.25 an hour. And as far as I'm aware, there are no plans currently for the Congress to uh, reimagine that amount. That's one very important part of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Another, probably equally important part, is the overtime calculation. For workers who are paid on an hourly basis, any time that worker works more than 40 hours in a calendar week, he or she is going to be entitled to time and a half for that time over 40 hours. So let's just do a little bit of an example here. Okay, so let's say, just for ease of use, I earn $10 an hour. And I ordinarily work 40 hours a week. So my gross pay is, and most of the time, going to be a little time sign here. is going to be $400 a week. That's gross. Obviously, there's going to be taxes that are going to be withheld. That's my expected wage. But this is the busy season in our place of employment. And so I'm still going to have this as my base pay, $10 an hour. But this particular week, I'm scheduled to work 50 hours a week. So we're going to have to do a bit more of a calculation here. My first 40 hours um, is going to be calculated the normal way. So for the first 40 hours, I will earn a $400 a week. We'll this time call it gross at um, non over over time, over time, right? And now we have to account for the last 10 hours, the difference between 50 and 40. And we'll add that to it. So that is 10 hours, and I'm going to be earning time and a half. So instead of it being $10, it'll be $15. So we'll say it's 1.5 times $10. times, and then difference between 50 minus 40. Oops. And that works out to be, can we have our $400 plus, and we'll do this math first. So this is the time and a half time my hourly rate, so that would be $15 times, again, the difference between the number of hours I was scheduled and 40. So that would be times 10. And that works out to 400, oops, 400. And then that is 150, oops, sorry, plus 150. And that works out to be $550. You can see without time and a half, I would have only earned $550.
$500. So that extra um, overtime has resulted in me earning $50 more that particular week. Now, not everybody in our economy is entitled to overtime pay. We have two classes of employees. One class we call exempt and one class we call non-exempt. The This terminology is wacky. It doesn't make a lot of sense because exempt is inherently a negative term. When you say someone is exempt from something, you mean they don't get to do something or they can't do something or they don't they don't have to do something it's a negative concept so to say non-exempt means you're talking about the people who don't fit into the category of people who don't have to do it in other words these are the people to whom it applies so people who earn overtime and exempt people are people who do not earn overtime. Most likely today, you fall into this first, um, to the second class, non exempt people. Most likely, you are eligible for overtime. Um, but as you progress in your career, you complete your education, and you go into a management position, you will make the switch into exempt. And that may sound like kind of a bummer because. Earning overtime is a cool thing. I mean, it increases your pay. Um, but in the long haul, for most uh, careers, it's a good thing for you economically to switch from non-exempt to exempt because even though you lose eligibility for overtime, your overall income is going to go up because um, the base pay that you get, the salary that you get, will more than compensate for your lack of uh, overtime pay. So that's a tra uh, transition that you'll likely see as you progress. So we've talked so far about two aspects of the FLSA. We've talked about the fact that it establishes a minimum wage and that it establishes time and a half pay for over 40 hours. Now we're not going to go into the details of this next provision because we just don't have enough time, but another aspect of the Fair Labor Standards Act is that it provides protections for workers who are under the age of 18. Um, uh, all the way down to age 14. There are certain protection levels. Um, this is more of a function of state law than federal law. So the federal protections are not especially robust and usually you go to state law to find out some more specifics. So you, there's definitely a partnership there between state and federal law. I will tell you that this is an area of great uh, specificity in many states, uh, not so much Texas, but other states, and a minor violation in this area can result in major fines. So if in your career you end up um, employing youth, uh, it's really important that you dot the I's and cross the T's. For example, let's say in the state you're working, 16-year-olds, uh, we'll say 15-year-olds can't work more than four hours in a day. And you, know, you just get deluged with work on a particular day. And so you have that 15-year-old uh, work um, four hours and 10 minutes. You might think to yourself, big deal, 10 minutes, who cares? I mean, that's a trivial amount. It sounds trivial, but it's huge in terms of violation. And so you want to be careful. And in fact, most people who employ children um, uh, who, who are trying to comply with these statutes actually under schedule significantly. Um, if the, stu the student can work four hours, you're probably not going to schedule them more than three hours because people do sometimes work beyond their hours and you want to make sure that you don't get into a violation situation. Another factor to consider is that it's not unusual under these circumstances that the children themselves will attempt to work more hours. After all, most of the time they want to earn more money, right? Or uh, the next person doesn't show up for their shift and so the, the child continues working. Maybe they're trying to be super responsible. It's not at all unusual for these workers to work beyond their schedules, even um, you know when that has been explained that they're not supposed to. So they do require extra levels of supervision to make sure that doesn't happen. And again, that's yet another reason to under schedule them. So if they work 30 minutes beyond their schedule time, they're still in compliance with the law. Okay, I already used the term exempt and non-exempt, but now we're gonna talk about who is exempt. Who are, who are these folks that are exempt? Um, I could teach easily a week-long course on just this topic. It's very, very th uh, dense. 
but I'm not going to. So we're going to just do an, an overview of this. These are the folks who are salaried. So another way to think about this is exempt are salaried. And non-exempt are typically hourly paid or commissioned. So how does how do we determine we're the employer? How do we determine whether Bob should be paid on an hourly basis and therefore be eligible for overtime or whether he ought to be paid on a salaried basis? Well, first of all, I think it's important to have a good understanding about what's at risk. You know, I said um, when we began this presentation that uh, really that, that this was only a relatively small part of the risk uh, that employers have, that really the big risk is with employment discrimination cases. And that is true. Um, that's just undeniably true. But if I were to carve out a single exception in this area, it would be in this area because while these are not overly common lawsuits, they are fabulously expensive. Millions and millions of dollars uh, because many times th these types of actions are ripe for class actions. Um, because you know, you're not just thinking about Bob, there's a there's hundred Bobs in your plant who all do the same work if you miss designate one Bob, you're probably misdesignating all of the Bobs. And then um, you have to do all that back pay, all those calculations, potentially for three years. And so it's very, very easy to get into millions of dollars very, very quickly. In an employment discrimination case, it's pretty difficult, short of class actions, to see those kinds of damages. So uh, this is a rare one, but it can be an especially dangerous one. It is almost always safe to make employ from a legal compliance perspective to make to pay people on an hourly basis and make them eligible for overtime. There's a lot of reasons though that employers really don't prefer that approach. I mean, one advantage is it is very safe from a legal perspective. The first reason that employers don't like it is that the workers themselves don't like it. There is definitely in our culture an idea. I don't think it's, it's a wise one. I don't think it's a good one, but it's definitely out there that somehow or another being paid on an hourly basis once you're, you know, out of college and going about your life, that that somehow is is not as cool as being salaried, that there's a status aspect to it. So that's one reason that employers uh, want to pay folks on a salary basis because they know that they're likely to attract more candidates for their jobs and better candidates for their jobs if they pay on a salary basis. Another thing that employers like about salary basis is that it allows there to be more predictability in payroll. Um, you know, if you are a, a retail store and your business has certain peaks, we'll say in November and December you sell more stuff and so you have to uh, staff your stores um, more and get people oftentimes into overtime positions, uh, there's going to be uh, huge increases in the costs. But if everyone is salaried, uh, yes, people are working more during those periods of time, but you're not paying them more. And so uh, that's a smooth uh, expense that your business is going to uh, bear. And so there aren't going to be the cash flow problems that you could have with overtime pay and not just overtime pay, but just generally fluctuating pay. So those are two big factors. Um, a third is that overtime pay can get really expensive. There's no doubt about that. Obviously, the higher the base pay that the person is, the higher paying to one and a half times that rate is. So those are some reasons why employers typically don't like to pay on, a, on an hourly basis. But the law uh, definitely requires that in many cases. Unfortunately for employers, the Fair Labor Standards Act was written during a time where our economy was very different. It was very manufacturing oriented. And so it was pretty easy to figure out who the bosses were and who the blue collar workers were. There weren't too many positions that were in that gray area that weren't quite blue collar workers, but weren't quite supervisors. And so because of these clear demarcations, 
um, employers really pretty much knew them. They not liked it, but they knew who was who. Our economy today is much more service oriented, much more knowledge based, and so it's much more difficult to figure out now is that person um, exempt or non exempt? And of course, the stakes are quite high if you make uh, the wrong call and you're the employer. Um, another problem with this is that because this law and the regulations are so um, out of step with our current economy, is that judges are all over the map. If you read the cases, you'll find that many times one judge will say, well, that position's clearly exempt. And then another judge, you know, two or three states over will say, well, clearly that position is non-exempt. They're very fact-intensive reviews, and it's hard to see a lot of patterns with respect to that. So there's a lot of caveats that you have to take in this area. I'm going to go over the four categories. Actually, there's another, there's a fifth category um, that, that isn't on this list. Uh, so I'll mention that briefly. Uh, but but the, the four and five categories that are excluded. But just keep in mind that there are not clear boundaries. The first one, um, Executives sounds like that would be the smallest categories. After all, what any, any even a large company like you know, we'll say like uh, J.C. Penney that has a hundred thousand employees, you might just think, well, there's probably no more than twenty true executives. Um, actually, that makes sense from an everyday usage perspective, but the way that the FLSA defines executives is extremely broad. And that's a useful thing to remember as you are looking at terms and statutes, is that the Congress or a state legislature can use a word to mean whatever it wants to mean, and then it's going to define that term. And they might define that term in a way that is dramatically different than everyday usage. And this is an example of that. Let me explain to you how the statute defines an executive. An executive is someone who has 80 hours per week of work assigned to him and he has to be paid over a certain rate. So if I am, um, we'll say I'm a, a department manager, we'll, we'll say I'm a department supervisor. I have two people reporting to me. They both, both work 40 hours a week. Um, so our whole department is three people. Guess what? I'm an executive. Um, you know, I'm absolutely at the bottom of the totem pole, or virtually at the bottom of the totem pole, and yet I'm considered an executive because I manage 80 hours. Um, sometimes what happens in those situations is that the employer takes advantage of that executive status and then declares that, oh yeah, Groover, you are going to be paid on a salaried basis. Then what happens? Well, times get tough with the employer, and so the employer cuts back on the hours. So I no longer have 80 hours that I'm supervising, I only have 70 hours that I'm supervising. Well, now I don't meet the statutory qualification for the executive exemption, and let's assume I don't satisfy any of the other categories. So I ought to be being paid on an hourly basis. If I now have 10 fewer hours of support, it probably means that I'm working more than 40 hours. Let's, let's assume for a second I was working 40 hours a week before. So we had 40 plus 40 plus 40. We had 120 hours. When the powers that be cut back my support to 70 hours, it probably meant that I went from working 40 hours to close to 50 hours. So I might not have been working any quote unquote overtime before. Of course, I wasn't eligible for overtime then. But now I am working overtime, but they haven't changed my pay status. Um, and so as a result, I am not earning my overtime rate. That's a very clear cut FLSA problem. Um, and there's just no gray area about that, and it happens all the time in businesses. So executive is kind of a misnomer. Another category of folks who are ex excluded from or exempt from the FLSA are administrative employees. If you work very long in a white collar environment, you will hear people refer to their secretaries as admins. And that's a very common terminology, administrative professionals. Um, that term, typically refers to uh, secretaries, receptionists, um, word processors, file clerks, people who perform those types of tasks. All of those people, all of the time, have to be paid on an hourly basis. 
That doesn't mean their work isn't incredibly important, incredibly stressful, that doesn't require very, very important and rare skills. It just means that the nature of the work is to be paid on an hourly basis. So the everyday term admin or administrative professional means something absolutely the reverse of what the statute says. So when we say that administrative employees are exempt from the FLSA, we're not talking about secretaries. We're talking about the people that the secretaries report to. Now these folks usually don't fall into the executive category. If they did, then we wouldn't have to worry about whether they were an administrative person or not, because you only have to fit one of these categories. So typically when we're evaluating administrative employees, we're considering people who have um, less than 80 hours reporting to them. But these are people who perhaps make important policy decisions within the organization. Um, they may be um, uh, developing programs, maybe marketing programs, or things along those lines, and they're making important uh, decisions about the company. And so under those circumstances, they're using a lot of independent judgment, and they're working independently. This one is probably the most uh, fuzzy of the ca categories. I'm not going to go through all the ins and outs of it. And again, we could spend hours on it, but that's the category um, that um, is also exempt. And then we have professional employees. And again, you might think to yourself, well, gosh, of course I'm going to be professional. I'm not going to be unprofessional. Well, that's not what this term means in this context. Uh, the term professional in everyday communication kind of has two meanings. One meaning is kind of business-like, um, ethical, uh, dresses appropriately, that kind of idea. That's not what is meant here. They are referring to employees who are in a profession. A profession is a technical term that refers to people who have to have attained a certain education and a certain credential in order to uh, perform in that area. Uh, for example, um, an attorney. You have to go to law school, you have to pass the bar before you can call yourself an attorney. A doctor has to go to medical school, has to pass his medical exams in order to practice as a, as a doctor. Similarly, a nurse or a CPA or a, a certain types of engineers. Those types of people are professionals. Um, so a, 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 a business person may earn much more money than those professionals, may do much more important things, may be much smarter than those professionals. But there is no test that that person had to pass in order to get this job, and so they are not a professional in that situation. Most professionals are going to fit into this category. Then we have outside salespersons. This is, um, generally speaking, salespeople are not exempt from the FLSA. Uh, they can be paid on an hourly basis or they can be paid on a commission basis. Either way is fine, but they're not going, they're going to be paid eligible for overtime. Um, that's certainly true for inside salespeople. But what, let's consider for a second how an outside salesperson functions. An outside salesperson doesn't have his customers come to him like would happen, say, in a furniture store. You know, obviously no one goes door to door saying, hey, you want to come buy some furniture from me? No, uh, the, 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 the potential customers are going to go to the place where the furniture is, to your particular store. But there are other situations in which a salesperson leaves his place of employment and goes out into the marketplace trying to persuade people to buy their products. Um, the classic example would be a fuller brushman who's going door to door trying to persuade people to buy fuller brushes. Um, an Avon salesperson. Um, many cases, those, those individuals were not actually employed by a company but were independent contractors, which is a completely different issue. Um, but let's imagine that you are hired um, to uh, persuade other businesses to use your software. So it's very likely that you will make appointments and go out to various businesses and make presentations and things along those lines. Well, think about it. Let, let's just go back to the world, say, of 1945, before cell phones, before pagers. It was essentially impossible for that manager to know 
where his workforce was at any particular time when the workers were outside salesmen and saleswomen. Um, just wasn't possible. Uh, cars didn't have phones. Uh, um, I, I, I could call in as a salesman and say, hey, I'm at, at, you know, the business, but in fact, I could be at the bar, right? He, there's no way that that um, manager could know. So if I were eligible for overtime pay as an outside salesperson, um, it would really just be an act of faith on the part of the manager. I mean, I could say I was working 70 hours a week, and maybe I wasn't working at all, and there would be no, or it would be very difficult for that manager to confirm that. And so this was carved out as an exception to reflect the fact that um, the logistical problems of knowing how many hours that person worked were very, very difficult. The work in and of itself is inherently the type of work we would expect that a non-exempt person would do. The fifth category is a computer person. A computer, computer people, computer programmers, for example, don't ordinarily fit into any of these other categories sometimes possibly an administrative employee, um, but that, that is a third, uh, fourth category that is only, um, I'm sorry, fifth category that's only come into uh, creation in the last, uh, well, well, be, well after this law was passed. And, um, and there are important limitations to this protection, which we won't go through here. Okay, well, as we talked about before, there are posters for everything. <laughs> and so um, you will need to have a poster for the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act, again, available for applicants and current employees. And then there is also the equivalent of that poster for, for Texas um, that will provide, say, the hourly rate in Texas. Here we have the federal one, and you can see it says when the, the wage rate went up, and you can see it went up in 2009, um, but there is no scheduled other increases at this time. As I said before, you can get each one of these posters, and, and again, they're available to be printed up off of the web, or very likely what you'll choose is to buy um, a big poster that has all of this information on this. By the way, if you ever come to my office hours, I've got some of those posters up, so. Very fascinating thing, as you can imagine, to see all these posters. Anyway, um, and then here is an example of uh, one of the uh, equivalents for the FLSA for Texas. This has to do with the Texas payday law. This is our first foray into Texas law, because up to this point, either Texas um, that hasn't had a particular law that's the equivalent of the federal law, or more likely, in most cases, its law exactly matched the federal law. So there was no reason to talk about it. This is our first time, though, that we actually are going to talk about a benefit that is available to Texan workers that is not covered in federal law. And so this is the payday statute in Texas. And this is really just one aspect of the law. And it says, Texas employers have to pay their employees who are exempt from the overtime provisions of the FLSA at least once a month. So if you are paid on a salaried basis, you have to be paid at least once a month. If you are non-exempt, in other words, you're hourly or commissioned, you have to be paid at least semi-monthly, which is twice a month, and each pay period must consist as nearly as possible of equal number of days. And so then the, this is the way that this is described. So you actually add this information to the form. Okay, so that's the end of our FLSA discussion. Now let's turn to the Family and Medical Leave Act. This law is incredibly complex. If you are looking to sue your employer, it is almost certainly the case that your employer is violating this law on a regular basis. It is so technical. There are so many deadlines and, and various things that have to happen that it is rare for any company to get it exactly right. In fact, the cost that the company would bear to be in 100% compliance would be so expensive that it would be better frankly, for the company to face the fact that it's occasionally going to have to pay out some sums, um, and that would be a cheaper way to go than, than otherwise. So um, hopefully you'll never have a major health issue, but if you do, <laughs> the upside is you probably see your employer. I'm not saying you should, but I'm saying that, that your employer isn't likely to get it uh, very close to right. A frustrating thing for me in this area, being an attorney, is that um, most – 
HR professionals do not have a very deep grasp of this law. Um, they don't really understand how it works. And so they really aren't even aware of how their particular company is not uh, satisfying all the elements of this law. Uh, so it's not just that they aren't complying with it, which can be reasonable given how difficult it is, but they don't even realize they're not complying with it. And that's not a good situation for the employer to be in. So uh, this area is very dense and very difficult to follow. And I'm just going to do, I'm not even going to hit the highlights. I'm going to hit a few of the highlights, okay? The Family and Medical Leave Act is typically called the FMLA. And the first thing to keep in mind is who is eligible for it? Well, not all employees are eligible for coverage under this law. Um, here are the categories. Uh, the first thing is that the um, employee has to have worked at least 1,250 hours in the last 12 months for this employer. So really part-time workers aren't going to be covered and em employees during their first year aren't going to be covered. So there's some significant parts of that workforce that are not going to be eligible for coverage in the FMLA law. Another thing is whether a particular employer is covered. I'm not even going to discuss that issue, but um, it is very work site specific. So I'm not lying when I say, Walmart, who employs you know, over a million people in the United States, it has places in the United States in which its workers are not covered by this law. And yet there could be a mom and pop organization that's not huge that is covered by this law. So it's a pretty uh, complex uh, way to look at, at the, the topics. And definitely you'd want to drill down and do some more investigation depending upon your circumstances. But let's assume that you figured out that this particular employee we'll call him Bob, is covered and that, that he, Bob's place of employment, his particular work site is also covered. Okay, so now our next inquiry is, does Bob have any FMLA time available? Well, he will be eligible to, for up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave during any 12 month period. Most employers choose to have this being a rolling 12 months. So you literally look back 365 days from, from this particular date and see how many days Bob has used. Um, and that will help you figure out how many days he has at, in his bucket at that time. There are other ways of handling it, but this is the way that most employers choose to proceed. Okay, so Bob um, has had some uh, health issue or some, something has come up in his life and he needs to have this time off and he let's assume he has time in his bucket available. We'll say that his doctor says he needs eight weeks off. Well FMLA is unpaid leave. This is really really confusing for many many folks. Um, that sounds like that okay uh, but Bob has some some vacation time He's got some sick pay. Uh, he's got some personal leave time. He's got lots of different buckets in this company. What about that? I mean, does, does Bob have to turn that money down in order to get his FMLA? Not at all. The federal law does not provide that the employer has to pay Bob for this time off, but it doesn't get in the way of any pay that Bob would be otherwise entitled to. Many employers do have some kind of PTO or vacation plan, and those benefits can run concurrently with the FMLA leave. So let's imagine for a second that um, Bob Bob uh, has two weeks of PTO, and we'll say one week of sick pay. So he has, we'll say, a total of 15 days, three weeks. Okay, so his first, and employers can set this up for highways. We're going to say that uh, Bob uses his sick pay first. So his first week, he will have one week of sick pay running concurrently with one week of FMLA. So he uses up one week of sick pay at the same time he's using up one week of FMLA. The second week he uses one week of PTO 
running concurrently with one week of FMLA. The third week, he's using his second week of PTO running concurrently with one week of FMLA. The fourth week, he no longer has any paid uh, time off, so he's just going to have one week of FMLA. Um, and so this would be his fourth week of FMLA. Many employers don't understand this. <laughs> Many employers will think, well, Bob will use his sick pay for the first week, and then they'll use his first week of PTO, then he'll use his second week of PTO, and then in the fourth week, he'll take his first week of FMLA. That's not how FMLA works. FMLA starts his very first week. It's really important from a statutory perspective to do that. It's going to sound weird because you might say, well, gosh, that, this sounds nicer the way most employers do it because that means Bob's going to get, in this case, three extra weeks of time off. It sounds nice, but it actually creates lots of compliance problems for the employer. Um, the employer can actually um, get into um, non-compliant situations pretty darn quickly if they don't start counting FMLA from that first occurrence. So, um, you, unless you are in HR, you're probably not going to be responsible for knowing the ins and outs of it, but just be aware that just because HR tells you it works in a certain way doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. Okay, so we've talked about how the 12 weeks work. Now we're going to talk about the situations that can arise that allow the uh, employee to take this time off. Uh, probably the single most common way that it comes about is when um, the employee has a child. This can be through adoption or birth. Um, the father is entitled to as much time off as the mother is. And this is the case even if the mother and father are not married to each other. And so um, both can, can claim the, the 12 weeks um, and um, proceed from there. And that is also the case for adoption, even if the adopt, adopted child isn't an infant. So these are the first two categories. There's more limitations on the birth of the child scenario that I'm not covering, but this is giving you a broad brush stroke. A third category would be it for the placement of a foster child. Um, and you can take off time from work in that situation. You can see how if you are routinely taking foster placements, which is awesome and wonderful that you do that, you would be you know, and con continuously entitled to the FMLA. Of course, many times that pay will be, un that leave will be unpaid, and so you might not find that economically feasible. So these are all kind of about getting a new kid in your family. Uh, but this next one is, uh, at least as important a category as these, um, uh, especially as your workforce ages. And this is to care, care for um, a serious um, – actually, I don't have this on here. I need to, need to add another bullet. Or oneself. Okay, um, so <coughs> you can take time off to care for a spouse, uh, your husband or your wife, your parents, not your parents-in-law, but your parents, your mother or your father, or your child, or yourself. You can take time off. So it doesn't include brothers and sisters, grandchildren, grandparents. Um, none of those people are covered in this category. Doesn't mean that the employer can't give you time off for it, just means that it's not covered by this particular statute. The um, eligibility requirement for whomever is ill is that that person has a serious health condition. This term is undefined in the statute. 
Uh, we had to wait until we got regulations from the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Administration to know how the regulators were going to define this. And they ultimately adopted a very expansive definition. There's actually several different categories that can qualify as serious health conditions, but the one that is most likely to capture most illnesses is that the person was sick for more than three days, saw a doctor or some other healthcare professional, and received some regimen. Uh, which can be something as minor as call me if you don't start feeling better or a prescription medicine or even an over-the-counter medicine, take some Advil. So basically you can see that if a person sees a doctor, most likely their condition is going to qualify as a serious health condition and then all of these uh, protections kick in. If it is an intermittent condition, let's say a person suffers from migraines, it might be fairly rare that that person has a four-day migraine, but they might have you know, one or two or three migraines a month. Then there is a special category for the intermittent or chronic conditions. They don't have to, each one of the episodes doesn't have to last this long, nor does the employee or the family member have to see a doctor every time they have an episode. Okay, so what are the benefits? We've established that Bob um, has satisfied all the requirements. He is FMLA eligible because of his length of employment. His employer is covered by the law. He has time in his bucket and he's had a qualifying event. What does Bob get out of this? Well, the first thing that he gets is that while he is on his FMLA leave, his employer is required to maintain his health insurance at active rates. Of course, this assumes that Bob had health insurance through his employer. Because if he didn't, then it's not really relevant. But if he did, he's entitled to that benefit. Most employers pay anywhere from two-thirds to three-quarters of the cost of their employees' health insurance. Again, I'm only talking about the employers who, who actually provide health insurance. Um, and so you can see how if the employer doesn't continue those rates, but instead requires that the employee pay the whole load, uh, both shares of that, um, that oftentimes is economically just not feasible for the employee, especially given the fact that the employee may be on an unpaid status and may be having significant medical expenses as, in addition. And so requiring that the employer keep active rates under these circumstances is a major, major benefit. Prior to the FMLA, the employer would have been required to keep the health insurance active, but it would have gone to inactive rates, which would have meant that the employee would be required to pay that full load, not just his quarter or his third, but the entire expense. Um, another, So that's one important benefit, the FMLA. Another important benefit is that the employer is required to keep that position open. Um, while that in-person employee is out. Um, you can see how this can play out. Um, imagine that um, Bob has had a, or, or Bob goes out on, on leave because he has Alzheimer's. Uh, there, at this time, we'll assume there's no treatment that will allow Bob to recover cognitive abilities. There's no chance that Bob will be better in 12 weeks he will not be returning to work. And so uh, the employer would like to go ahead and replace Bob. I mean, it's, it's very sad that Bob has this condition, but uh, keeping the job open is not going to um, improve the quality of Bob's life. But under the law, Bob's position can't be fulfilled, can't be filled by someone else until 12 weeks and one day after the leave. At that moment, then Bob can be transitioned to inactive rate health insurance and his employment quite possibly can be ended at that time. Um, but those really aren't the hard calls. Those aren't uh, what makes it tricky for employers. It's really the chronic conditions that make it tricky because there are people who oftentimes through no fault of their own have a chronic condition and um, they will need to miss a large portion of work forever. Maybe they have diabetes, maybe they have chronic migraines, maybe they have multiple sclerosis, 
um, or cancer or something along those lines. And so they may need to take off several days a month for treatment or to deal with flare-ups of their conditions. And even though they're missing several days a month, over the course of the year, it doesn't add up to 12 whole weeks. It's an afternoon here, a morning here, a couple of days here. And even at the end of the year, maybe they've only missed, you know, 11 weeks in three days. And so guess what? They never get to that 12-week point. And so the employer has to deal with the fact that they have an employee who isn't here on a regular basis, and yet that employee can't be replaced or disciplined for his absenteeism. Here is the poster. Again, uh, you post the poster separately or you can uh, get one of those all-in-one posters. And again, this is, uh, I'm just kind of hinted at some of the complex features in this law. Unemployment compensation is completely state law driven. We don't see, well, I'm saying completely, generally speaking, state law driven. Um, it uh, provides for money for employees who lose their jobs for reasons unrelated to job misconduct. So if I steal from my employer, um, I'm gonna be fired, obviously. And if I apply for un unemployment, my employer is likely to contest my eligibility and if the evidence is strong that I committed the crime, I will be denied the benefits. Um, unemployment compensation is especially appropriate when there's a layoff situation, a work, uh, reduction situation and that's how I lose my job. Um, the the uh, intention of the law is um, not to deny benefits though. So even if maybe I was a little bit irresponsible, it's not unusual that I might still be awarded unemployment compensation. For example, let's say that I missed work fairly often and I was terminated because of my poor attendance, but if I can provide documentation that it was health related, that I didn't have a lot of choices about that situation, then the um, hearing examiner might well say that wasn't misconduct. When they say that um, I'm entitled to unemployment compensation doesn't mean that the employer was wrong to fire me. It just means that I'm entitled to uh, take advantage of unemployment insurance. And just like you have insurance on your car um, so that if you're in an accident, you'll be able to uh, get your car repaired. Well, that's the idea behind unemployment insurance. It allows you to tap into that benefit so that you can uh, maintain your income as you, or at least not, not maintain it completely, but have some income as you seek other em employment. While you are on unemployment benefits, you'll have to demonstrate to the state agency that you are actively seeking appropriate employment. Workers' compensation laws are, are interesting. Um, our law in Texas is different than it is in most states. Um, most states require that employers provide unemployment compensation. Um, and states do it in a variety of ways. Some choose to have a, a state insurance product so that you actually buy it from the state. Others allow private insurers to provide this, this coverage. Uh, Texas and Oklahoma are the only two states that I'm aware of that, that permit employers not to have any workers' compensation insurance. And this was a development, I guess we've had it this way for about 25 years maybe a little bit more than that. And um, many, many employers have chosen to go bare, which is the expression that general legal professionals use. In fact, I would say that's the more common uh, relationship nowadays in Texas. And most employers choose not to carry workers' compensation coverage. There are two different posters in Texas depending upon the decision that the employer made. This is when the employee player has coverage. Um, and this would be an example of the poster that would need to be posted. And then here is when the employer has chosen not to have coverage. Um, just because an employer has chosen not to have coverage doesn't mean that the employee can't sue if he's injured at work. But it does present some pretty significant problems for the employee in pursuing that type of employment. Again, kind of beyond the scope of this class to go into more detail about that. COBRA. COBRA is a federal law, so we're, we're moving from state law to federal law at this point. 
And this law provides that um, when an employee loses his or her job or the hours are reduced to the extent that he or she loses eligibility for health insurance, the employer has to allow that employee to maintain the health insurance for up to 18 months. Of course, they're not going to pay at the active rate, they're going to pay at that inactive rate. So instead of paying, you know, the quarter of the premium cost or the 30% of the premium cost, they're going to be paying 100, actually they're going to be paying 102% of the premium cost. Remember when we were talking about FMLA, I said they get to pay at the active rate, but before FMLA went into effect, um, they still would have been able to continue their coverage. Well, prior to FMLA, we had COBRA, and we still have COBRA today, but we, COBRA was what would have filled in the gaps under those circumstances while the person is on leave. COBRA applies not just to leave circumstances pre-FMLA, but it also applies to times where a person maybe was full-time and dropped to part-time and loses benefits, or they resign from their employment, or they are fired. Um, it's pretty common when you go from one employer to another at your new employer that there will be some waiting period before you can participate in health insurance. And so most people are going to elect to have their COBRA benefits during that period of time so they don't have a gap in coverage. You don't need to know what the long name for the COBRA Act is. As you can see, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. The name isn't related to um, the benefits that we're talking about here. Just remember this guy. He's the guy that's going to keep you uh, covered when you are switching from one employment position to another. ERISA is another important statute. This is the, uh, it's against federal law that provides minimum benefit standards for voluntary pension and health plans in private industry. Private companies aren't required to have pensions and they aren't required to provide health insurance. Now, that's somewhat not true if you consider the Affordable Health Care Act, but ERISA was a law that came down the pike um, well before the Affordable Health Care Act, which is, as you probably know, also called Obamacare and whatever may new laws that may come down the pike with, with disrespect. So employers are not required to have these plans, but if they choose to have these plans, it's very likely that they will want to take advantage of certain tax benefits that their companies will, will have as a result of these plans. Well, this statute explains to those employers how they can take advantage of these tax benefits. And so this explains what, how good the benefits have to be in order for the tax benefits to kick in. You don't need to know the long name of this act, although this, the name of this act is more logical, <laughs> Employee Retirement Income Security Act. OSHA is our next statute, and OSHA provides, it's against a federal law, and uh, both the name of the law and the name of the agency are, is the same. The actual law is the Occupational Safety and Health Act. You don't need to know the name. The agency that administers it is the Occupational Safe and Healthy Administration. Safety and Health Administration. They're both called OSHA. Um, this agency uh, sets workplace safety standards and it enforces the act. It does investigations and it can levy fines against employers that don't comply, especially if you work in an industrial environment where there are genuine hazards. It's, this is a very, very important statute. There can be very significant fines. If you work in a, a white-collar environment, an office environment, it usually is a less severe concern, although even there you can have some concerns. Here is again an example of the OSHA poster. And we'll touch briefly upon privacy. The general rule is that when you are engaging in a private conversation or a private email exchange, your employer isn't supposed to listen into it. They can't monitor that type of calls. If it's a business situation, they can monitor it, but as they're listening in on the call, if they notice that it is a personal call, then they need to disconnect at that time. Um, there is a business extension exemption, which allows the em employers to monitor telephone calls um, in the ordinary course of their business. This assumes that, of course, this is the line that the business is playing for. Um, and um, usually employers are going to require that the employee gives, give that consent to that monitoring. That's the safest course of action for the employer. Um, most employers want to 
be able to monitor as broadly as they can because they want to make sure that workers are doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're not, you know, uh, giving away trade secrets or they're not doing unethical actions or things like that. And so they want the employees to feel like anything I send out or any call I make could potentially be monitored. And one important strategy for employers in this regard is to um, communicate to the employees that they have no reasonable expectations of privacy at work. And the way that the employer would do that would be to tell the employee, you have no reasonable expectations of privacy at work. Many employers give a notice to employees along those lines once a year or so. If the employer does that, then that undercuts any argument the employee had that um, their, their telephone calls weren't going to be monitored. I can tell you, having worked in corporate America, that monitoring is a very, very uh, ubiquitous, per pervasive thing. You never want to be visiting a website or making a telephone call or reading an email that you would not be very, very comfortable with your boss knowing about because your boss probably will know about it. And so uh, you save all that personal stuff uh, for uh, non-company time and non-company resources. Lie detectors. The takeaway here is just don't have your employees submit to lie detectors as part of the job. A lie detector or polygraph is really junk science. It's not uh, reliable and there are very heavy penalties if you have your employees submit to lie detector type tests and you have them follow the very specific and onerous rules. Um, it's very rare that it's going to get you um, benefits. The only time that you might want to consider using polygraphs um, is when you're required to. When you are uh, say a government contractor and doing some kind of a top security work, say like Lockheed or Boeing or doing something say with the military defense, as soon as you have to um, uh, do lie detectors, then you have to comply with these laws. But the takeaway is um, it's rarely a good move for you to use lie detectors in the workforce. Let's say you have three employees, you think one of them is stealing from you, you don't know which one, you can't figure it out. Uh, better to just fire all three of them. <laughs> I hate to be callous, but that's the better course of action. Uh, having them submit to a polygraph, you probably won't find out who really stole from you, number one, and number two, suddenly you may be facing significant fines if you did it in any way other than a perfect way. USERA is another important law. This law is the most generous benefit law that we have that we'll talk about in this a particular chapter. It's wildly generous to employees um, and it makes sense because these are our folks who are serving us in the military. These are people who have been called up to active duty sometimes for years and now they're ready to return to their civilian job and they have very very generous benefits available to them. They're allowed automatic reinstatement, they're guaranteed depending upon the circumstances, up to a year of pretty much bulletproof employment. They are entitled to any raises or any promotions that they would have gotten if they had been continuously employed. Just really, really insanely ben generous benefits. Um, and so when you are managing people who are returning from some kind of um, a reservist duty, be sure to talk with HR to make sure that you are uh, dotting every I and crossing every T. Because the benefits are so much more generous than it is for other laws, uh, your instinct in this area, your experience may lead you um, to do things, to not do as much as you are legally required to do. And then here's an example of that all-in-one poster part that would apply to you, Sarah. So we have completed the individual employment rights section. If you have any questions, as always, please uh, send me an email, come to my office hours, or bring that um, question to my attention in class. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day.